assassin. I'm a soldier. You're neither. You're an errand boy. Sent by grocery clerks. To collect a bill. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya East is east and west is west and never the twain shall meet. It's hard to dispute the validity of this well-known aphorism from Rudyard Kipling but Prabhupada made an effort to overcome it. Whether or not that was successful from the institutional perspective is subject to debate. The issue to be explored in this month's presentation, however, is branding, specifically how the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation has branded itself how it continues to label and thus mask itself, and what the reality of this prosaic pretense actually is behind the corporate persona. As you all know, our continuing series delves into the root issues of why the so-called Krishna movement has become what it now is. The last two videos explained very pointed topics. But this month we go global as we overview what so-called ISKCON purports to be in terms of its public persona. In other words, we shall analyze whether or not its presentation of itself is just another illusion, just another grand institutional delusion. The persona of the ISKCON mission, always in a flux state of fix-it-as-you-go drift, serves as a fix, the needle in and the damage done. This fix reassures its addicted members that they are engaged in important spiritual work meriting eternal benefit no matter how poorly the organization performs. Everyone in it is assured constantly that everything will be all right as long as the mission remains authorized by its vitiated governing body. In so-called ISKCON, that is, of course, the GVC, which is revered like a god. It is considered by some in the cult to be the successor in the parampara brought to the West by Srila Prabhupada. So-called ISKCON is said to be his body and the GBC is indisputably the power node of that body. Now we are in Lord Chaitanya's golden age for over the last 500 years or more, but the vast majority of devotees are unable to readily discern that we are in that golden age from any obvious indicators. Yet the golden age still has over 9,000 years of duration left ahead. So we should not be overwhelmed by the reality of today's difficult moment. The inability to recognize it now is because we are in a juxtaposition where access to the knowledge of Krishna has expanded quite exponentially, while influences of the perverted reflections, semblances of what are wrongly alleged to be Lord Chaitanya's movement, predominate, but they do so only on the superficial plane. Those deviations in concert with Western culture are covering genuine transcendence quite effectively at this time. Nevertheless, if you listen carefully 
with higher intelligence. You can and will overcome the faulty propaganda being pushed by cult triangulation at this time. But as usual, today's presentation focuses upon the big kahuna of those three. Long term, without question, the most dangerous of the lot, the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation. It must be exposed philosophically. That's what we do here. It can also be exposed in terms of its procedural impositions. We do that as well, but those are a bit less important. Exposing it at the root serves to check its influence within the astral body of the unbiased hearer or reader who thus takes advantage of this message in the right way. Assimilating this message means that so-called ISKCON can no longer have any meaningful effect within you because you have exorcised the influence of its malefic egregor. You are thus no longer involtuated by it. The ISKCON melodrama is all a state of confusion, but you do not require to be caught in that. Dishonesty and denial are the standard in so-called ISKCON, and it has reached the point where its leaders and many of its members believe that the institution would not even be able to survive if it were straightforward about its actual history. We give you that history. Basically, the cult consists of only nominal Vaishnavs projecting a semblance of Eastern process, although that semblance is nothing more than gold plating over the Western lead which underlies it. You need to see it as such to realize all of the make show as little more than an institutional farce. Now any unfortunate trapped within its orbit discovers in due course, much to his or her chagrin, that one of its features is that of an addictive organization brandishing a confused communication process. Gossip and so-called secret knowledge buttress the chief features of the GBC mystique. Obviously, this nation starts from the top and it works its way down through the lower echelons, thus constituting an organized religion. Real knowledge is always suppressed in that thing, replaced by factoids and disinformation meant to spread the so-called glories of its big guns, while institutional gurus and rentacharyas get less credit. In effect, they are nothing more than errand boys, working for the clerks, running the governing body, collecting on a bill of goods bought by fools, those who neglected due diligence in their research before joining that religion. The ISKCON misleaders must always be pseudo-mystical and secretive because once their secret is outed, the whole make show collapses. Their scheme will be quickly dismantled when it is unmasked. Notice I did not say if, I said when. You may read the minutes of an annual GBC conclave on internet posts, but none of that reveals what is really going on inside of those meetings. Also, if you read the transcription of those minutes, you will notice in many places entries such as quote unquote unpublished. Why? Because if what that entry entails was revealed, it would be very counterproductive to the power node of its egregor. The four sampradayas are the bhakti traditions validated by Padma Purana, which is in the mode of goodness. The Gaudiya Vaishnava disciplic succession comes within one of those four paramparas, namely the Madhva sampradaya. Nevertheless, it is certainly different from what is considered today in India to represent the line of Madhvacharya. 
the teachings and processes of the real branch of Eastern teaching representing the Bhakti Siddhanta is what we represent here and it is affiliated with the traditional Matva Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. Now here's a very important point. When there is any substantial deviation from that tradition, concoction is indicated. Concoction must never be tolerated. Concoction is mental speculation which has no place in any genuine disciplic succession. Mental speculation is a serious sin. Becoming an acolyte of a bona fide Vaishnava parampara entails getting free from sin. How can you light a fire by pouring water on it? Western religion, Western philosophy, and Western culture constitute a non-Vedic concoction. After the Greek foundation of Socrates, none of the theistic Western successions attributed to their founders has remained intact. The personalist teachings, even when they were still somewhat bona fide many centuries ago, nevertheless were even then nothing but ABCD basics. Some claim that Iesus Christos can still be served, but this is little more than a far-fetched sentiment. The Western brand of so-called religion is fit to be rejected. It is no longer even having the power to promote its adherence to the heavenly planets. What to speak of the eternal spiritual world of form and activity? Consider these three excerpts from letters by His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada. The first excerpt from a letter to Voktadas, dated August 3rd, 1973. Quote, After all, what do they have to offer? In the Christian religion, all we see is Christ's picture as he was crucified. So how people can be attracted to such a thing? There is no science, philosophy. It is no wonder that the people are rejecting this nonsense, not that Christ himself was nonsense, but those who are preaching it in his name, they are nonsense. Because they do not even follow the simplest of his orders, thou shalt not kill. I have met so many Christians, and when I ask them why Christians are killing, they cannot answer." Unquote. An excerpt from a letter to Raya Rama, dated October 22, 1971, quote, If you want to preach the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ on the principles of Bhagavad Gita, you will find so many differences those who are following Jesus Christ, let them follow strictly to the principles of their Bible. Thou shalt not kill is now being misinterpreted by Christian priests. They say, thou shalt not murder. This means that they are trying to save themselves from the crime of animal killing, unquote. Then an excerpt from a potent letter to Nityananda dated August 16th, 1972, quote, Regarding your questions, in the sense that they do not belong to disciplic succession, in that sense Christ, Buddha, and the others are not bona fide. But because they have got some special power, we accept them as bona fide. Just like Buddha, we accept him as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sometimes they play like that because they may have to. Although they are bona fide, they play sometimes as unbona fide. For example, we reject Buddha as unbona fide, but we accept him as an incarnation of God. We worship Lord Shiva as a Vaishnava, but as a demigod, we reject him. But to speak the truth, these personalities are not bona fide because who is caring for them? This so-called resurgence of feeling for Christ by the young people is due to our Krishna consciousness movement." Unquote. But what Krishna consciousness movement? That is the question today. We see that in a somewhat different context. The same malignant principalities that effectively degraded Christianity 
and they're at work in the so-called Krishna movements, especially as far as so-called ISKCON is concerned, it is a cauldron of concoction. Its degradation is transpiring more quickly today than Christianity did back in previous centuries, that's all. And what happens in the society at large when such degradation takes hold? It sinks. It becomes nihilistic. It becomes hedonistic. It becomes agnostic and then comes then come atheists full of anger. It becomes sadistic, a faithless opponent to all theistic teaching, even when those teachings are fundamentally flawed. It becomes demoniac and then degrades into the diabolical. It becomes loaded with rioters, looters, freeloaders, vandals, arsonists, and killers. Murder becomes commonplace in such godless societies, and this can all ultimately be attributed to the deviations allowed to enter its religion, which is supposed to have buttressed the law and order desired by those civilizations originally. Such is the plight of the West today, as its major cities in America are breaking down and cratering. Such is not supposed to be the plight of Eastern traditions but ask yourself this question. Are they still actually Eastern? We are not concerned with Buddhism, no matter how strict it superficially appears to be. Similarly, we reject Mayavad. However, what happens to the theistic manifestation of Eastern teaching when it becomes infiltrated by concoction? It goes the same route as Christianity, that's what. However, remember that history never exactly repeats. Instead, it only rhymes. What entered so-called ISKCON back in the late 70s? The answer is rather basic. Leftism. What is at the root of all postmodern Western ideas? It is antagonism against anything traditional either of Eastern or Western origin. This began in a big way in Europe with rationalism, of course. Earlier than that in its philosophical development, it stemmed initially from the ontological speculations of ancient pre-Socratic Greece, which entailed a rejection of all mysticism connected to humanities controlled by gods. But humanity remains controlled by the demigods and always will. And there's another thing. Always remember that the ISKCON brand lists left. Although there is secondarily a right wing and a left wing within it, we must develop a perspective beyond that. The so-called conservatives in that cult are not what they appear to be because what they project and represent is not actually traditional. In other words, they are just as deviated ultimately from the Guru Parampara as their comrades representing the liberal wing. Now, in order to understand this a little better, let us employ, employ an analogy. For the purpose of visualizing this analogy, picture in your mind that there are numerous folding chairs atop the deck of a battleship. This battleship is called the HMS Iskan. It is in the service of Her Majesty Maya. Now half of those chairs are colored red and they all have a big noticeable R on the backs of them. The other half are colored bright blue and they all have a noticeable left painted on them. These represent the right and left wings of the Iskan bird of prey. However, just like ants crawling atop a vinyl record while it is on the turntable, the individual movement of the ants on the record is subordinated 
to the overall movement of the LP itself. When you, when you watch the ants, you consider them all moving in a constant circle, although individually and secondarily they are also making inconsequential movements on their own. Another way of saying the same thing, watch the traffic and not the lights. If a battleship moves straight on a flat sea, no problem. Then a right chair is what it is and a left chair is what it is. However, if the battleship lists either to the starboard or the port side, all the chairs will automatically shift in that direction. And always remember that the ISKCON ship lists left. Those red chairs are just as leftist ultimately as are the chairs that outwardly declare their allegiance to the cause of the new left in so-called ISKCON. Both wings are engaged in concoction, creating nothing more than a semblance of quasi-devotion, which is what the so-called ISKCON has been and will continue to be for decades running. Now, it advertises itself as an Eastern cult, but you should know it is no such thing. It is cent per cent Western because it operates according to the Western pulse of fix-it-as-you-go concoction, also known as mental speculation. Take, for example, FDG. How ridiculous is the GBC ruling concerning FDG? It is incredulous that any transcendentalist cannot see the glaring concoction intrinsic in FDG. The governing body mandates that there now can be female Diksha gurus as long as they jump the institutional hoops of their fellow rentachires and then receive the no objection certification. This imprimatur, by the way, from the GBC is said to validate who is and who is not a guru in so-called ISKCON. FDG has been and continues to be very divisive in so-called ISKCON. And that is recognized by all of its leaders everywhere. As it already constitutes a de facto split that could augur a de jure schism, and it would be a very big schism, wouldn't it? As such, the two sides, in their official statements, they speak to each other in codes. Your host speaker now explains those codes, but first you need some pre preliminary facts connected to recent events. The FDG issue has been broiling in so-called ISKCON for one and one-half decades. It was a kind of cold war between the left-wing left liberals and the right-wing traditionalists, so-called traditionalists. The left wanted female Diksha gurus. The right was opposed, what to speak of allowing them to initiate. Now, the right wing had the Shastrik edge, and they had some potent evidence. In brief, because we could go into this in much greater detail, in brief, it is well known that Prabhupada never appointed a female as a temple president, never appointed a female as a GBC or a Ritvik. He never appointed any of them as sannyasis, nor did he give any of them the sacred thread to supplement Brahminical initiation, which only some of them attained. The Western version of so-called ISKCON has been strongly in favor of FDG for decades. And it comes as no surprise that it's been especially strongly in favor by the Dragon Ladies, of course. Now, the Indian Bureau was dead against it and has been and continues to be. Finally, and there's an irony in this, in India, late last year, FTG was finally approved. Officially, this took place at a mid-annual GBC conclave. The death blow resolution was a continuance of section 701.6 entitled ISKCON Spiritual Masters. 
it read as follows. I'm going to have to break it up a little bit here. Quote, Vaishnavis are eligible to give Diksha in ISKCON provided that they, and then after that there's three entries in A, B, C. We're only concerned with the third one. So it says, C, receive written permission from the appropriate regional body or its equivalent or national council to give Diksha in that particular part of the world, unquote. The codes here are the mention of quote unquote regional body and quote that particular part of the world, unquote. As to be expected, the Indian Bureau came down hard against the resolution, somewhat indirectly threatening to succeed from the rest of so-called ISKCON. Nevertheless, this resolution approving FDG was confirmed at the annual meeting in Mayapur, West Bengal in February of this year, not that long ago. The following entry was added to that approval. Quote, the question has always been how to implement the practice. No, it hasn't, but anyway. The question has always been how to implement the practice. This resolution balances the cultural concerns of certain areas of the world with the need to follow both our tradition and our founder Acharya, unquote. Oh, notice that. <laughs> In other words, our tradition and our founder Acharya, meaning that they're saying the founder Acharya wants female Diksha Gurus. Anyway, aside from mentioning implementation, a real buzzword, the code here is, quote, balances the cultural concerns of certain areas of the world, unquote. Certain areas. It's an olive branch to the Indian Bureau. It's code. Such a concession cannot be directly legislated, but the left wing is through its code signaling to the right wing that its female Disha Gurus will de facto, as opposed to de jure, keep their initiations within the regions wherein they have received their institutional pre-approval for the no objection certificate, mandatory as said before for all gurus in that cult. That olive branch may not be enough for the Indian Bureau, which countered with a blistering position paper, noting, quote, the members of the Bureau feel that the GBC, feel? What is that? The members of the Bureau feel? What are we talking about, feel? Anyway, quote, the members of the Bureau feel that the GBC re resolution authorizing female Diksha Gurus, even on a regional basis, will adversely affect ISKCON India, as devotees around the world treat ISKCON as one united institution and not compartmentally, with each having its own systems of initiation, unquote. The code in the Indian Bureau's objection here is quite obvious, quote, even on a regional basis, unquote. FDG via GBC mandate is deviated, of course. But in the context of how the institution has been operating for the last 42 years, it is not contradictory. It's what they've been doing for decades. However, that does not automatically make FDG shastrically valid. Oh, that's a stumbling block. How to get past it? Well, the governing body, the great engine of concoction that it is, of course, came up with a way, or rather, insidiously semi-legislated a way to overcome the stumbling block. Simply allow the regions of its international society to either accept or reject the female gurus as they please. To state it another way, in other words, the leftists, they get their female gurus who now officially score the disciples they were cultivating for years anyway. Full rubber stamp. And for those on the ISKCON right wing who have realized, obviously, that there can never be any such thing as a female Mathematikari Diksha Guru, they can take shelter of the region, mostly in India, if not totally in India, that does not accept the dragon ladies as gurus or their disciples. Tatvamasi. 
codes notwithstanding, so-called ISKCON thus unwittingly creates a new zonal acharya system in the form of new covert zones, blue zones. The dragon ladies are worshipable. Reactionary right zones, no feminine gurus recommended, recognized, or allowed. Cannot any sane person recognize what is really going on here? They're doing their own thing. What is actually going on can be summed up as follows. The authority is not from Shastra. The authority is not based upon reason or logic. The authority is not free from concoction. The authority is not free from contradiction. The authority is not part of the Parampara tradition. The authority is never found anywhere within the disciplic succession of the Chaitanya branch founded by Prabhupada. Instead, the so-called authority can be compared to a repeater key. You know, you have the keyboard. So you hit the seventh letter of the alphabet on the keyboard and automatically on the, uh, on the monitor, up pops GBC, 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 GBC. Sort of like how the monitor kept repeating Sam, 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 and Ghost. Except this power node is institutional, physically manifest, and far, far more dangerous than any ghostly haunt anywhere in the world. Why do we say so-called authority? Because the governing body commission of the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation possesses no spiritual or devotional authority whatsoever. There is no spiritual sequence issuing from it. Such has been the case since March of 1978. What does it possess? It possesses institutional power in the guise of authority, that's all. And you should know this. You should have known this many years ago. And if you're still falling for the GBC shtick, that's on you. ISKCON misleaders want their followers to remain in a state of cognitive dissonance and subconscious confusion because this makes them easier to addict and exploit. By maintaining an addictive system, they cheat misguided seekers who join the organization because none of those broken-hearted people were sincere enough. Most of them remain in the thing because they derive some illusory benefit, often in terms of reassurance but the numbers are dwindling. Constituting a clever rewrite of history, the cult takeover includes changing the books, purging malcontents, claiming the institutional legacy, manipulating the media and academia, and soaking the Hindus. The new ISKCON collectivism advocates its own brand of philosophy and culture all critics be damned. Their brand is whatever they say it is. If they say it's Eastern, then that's what it is. If they indicate that it's also Western, well, that's a mistake, but certainly not inaccurate. Their brand is Eastern. Their brand is Western. Either way, their ship always lists left. Cult and organized religion are a terrible combo in postmodern Kali Yuga. The Latin term cultus, when applied to so-called ISKCON, includes the demand of service and surrender beyond mere adoration. Its top echelon consists of the new godmen of an organized religion, which also includes institutional gurus and party men, second echelon, all of them, or lower. It is a society of cheap gurus and cheap disciples, including cheap initiations. For the big guns, many of whom are warlocks with dandas, you must do more than merely demonstrate respect, honor, and reverence. Criticizing them is a pseudo-religious form of treason. For example, the 11 pretender Mahabhagavats of the Zonal Acharya era were worshipped like Roman emperors. That pretense cratered, but the same pulse remains. 
except now it's hidden behind better branding that includes disguises with more effective deceptions. Kindly do not forget that we're exploring root issues in this series connected to the degradation of what superficially appears to be Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement, and branding is certainly a root issue. The branding of so-called ISKCON is not only its attempt to establish an institutional personality in the world of conditioned souls, but also an effort to cover its root character. Character. That is deeper than its subtle personality. And character, its character, is also far more deceptive and extremely dangerous in the long term. The ISKCON brand for the past couple of decades or so has often labeled itself as Hindu, even in advertising. Ironically, this is both accurate and deceptive at the same time. The explanation of how this is so is a bit complicated, so remain aware of the explanation as I give it. Oh, you remember that saying back in the 70s, don't lump us in? Since the cult pretends to be a genuine representative of the Vaishnava Sampradaya, which it isn't, then branding itself Hindu in that context is deceptive. Although most Westerners still do not know it, Vaishnavism has nothing to do with Hinduism. In point of fact, in point of fact Vaishnavism is opposed to the Hindu hodgepodge just as much as it's opposed to Far Eastern Buddhism and Shinto. However, that so-called deception, pretending to be Hindu when allegedly it is Vaishnav, also constitutes an ISKCON deception within a deception. Again, a little bit complicated, try to understand. How so? Well, with ISKCON labeling, and sometimes even in its advertising itself as Hindu, that branding is ultimately accurate. This statement appears to be a contradiction, but your host speaker does not promulgate contradictions. The apparent contradiction can be resolved. Listen carefully. Hinduism is a third order simulacrum of Shankara Mayavad, of hardcore Advaita Vedanta. Although most Hindus, despite being vegetarian, are not all that strict in their sadhana and in their rituals, such is not the case with the leaders and inmates of Shankara in the four quarters of India. Those centers are extremely strict, extremely austere, and their rituals are very, very demanding. Their teachings, although based on false philosophical foundations, are also hardcore. You can only be born in an upper class caste or family in order to join one of those four sects, and you must be a Brahmin in order to even study their texts. In such study, you must accept what you are taught right in the beginning, their very first principles you must accept fully before you can engage in any further study. Now, Hinduism has no such requirements. On the whole, it is sentimental and rather loose. In other words, third order Shankarites. Nevertheless, it is based upon Shankara from millennia ago, but such Advaita Vedanta is not easily understood by anybody now, including most Hindus. In that sense, you can say that it is based upon what may be called orthodox teachings, although it neither understands nor follows much of that dogma. Now, we all know that many Hindus have favorable sentiments about Vishnu or Krishna. Some of it is accurate, most of it is not. And since Brahman, Mahavishnu, and Krishna are given their places, wrong places, in the Advaita pantheon or hierarchy, in that sense, try to understand, in that sense you can say that Hindus are also a simulacrum of a wrong conception of the absolute truth about Vishnu. Vishnu means Vaishnavism. To take it, the logical next step, Mahavishnu holds pride of place, not Krishna, Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu holds pride of place in the Shankara hierarchy, just under 
the so-called topmost echelon of impersonal Brahman. According to Shankara, and all Hindus believe this as well, the goal of the conditioned soul is merging the Atma of the conditioned self into Brahman, becoming allegedly one with Brahman. In this way, Hindus can also loosely be understood as a third order simulacrum of Shankara's conception of Vaishnavism. As such, what is so-called ISKCON? It's the same thing, just a little bit removed. It is a second order simulacrum of the original teachings, rituals, rules, and regulations of genuine Vaishnavism as promulgated by His Divine Grace in the form of His branch of the Madhva Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. Fabricated so-called ISKCON is a semblance of that. In that sense, so-called ISKCON actually can be equated with Hinduism. The apparent contradiction is removed if you have been able to assimilate this explanation, which admittedly is a bit complicated. So-called ISKCON convinces the Western Hindu about its so-called legitimacy while projecting a different persona to the rest of America. In a sense, as far as the Hindu diaspora is concerned, so-called ISKCON wants them all to believe that it also is a branch of mainstream Hinduism, which is not inaccurate. So-called ISKCON strives to secure this reputation, and to some degree it has succeeded. Nevertheless, if you have been watching our videos, you're catching on. People are catching on. There are some problems, such as all of that child abuse and lawsuits connected to it, and all of the gold-plated grift that so-called ISKCON is engaged in over many decades of picking the pockets of the gullible. These things have to be merged into oblivion, but that does not come easily as the written record remains. And the grift still continues, of course. Nevertheless, ISKCON fairy tales keep their allure, even if the cult, through historical revisionism, is able to hide its shenanigans to a greater or lesser extent. Its revamped brand entails a transformation of previous deviated policies, beliefs, and dogmas, and its patented fix-it-as-you-go strategy buys the thing more time. Another transformation awaits the breakdown of the current third transformation the Hinduization of so-called ISKCON, and that third transformation and that Hinduization is clearly in decline. With GBC and Primature, a most outrageous display of self-apotheosis was attempted by so-called ISKCON. It was done so in the late 70s and most of the 80s by 11 pretender Ma Bhagavats. The scheme did not work, so they don't do it that way anymore. Instead, with a borderline exception here and there, their brand has now morphed into institutional apotheosis, which is ultimately more dangerous, far more dangerous. It offers an automatic ticket to Godhead by simply remaining loyal to its governing body in combination with its own warped variety of quasi-Hinduism, including some easy ritual, some run-of-the-mill mysticism, and other superficial stuff, such as free food and festivals, so-called ISKCON can and does exploit lost souls. This is now integral to its current brand, and the cult also converts Hindu celebrations, like Holi, into something called quote-unquote color fest. Mixing this with a little brand of legend and a whole lot of sentiment, it is taken out of context and colorfully converted to suit the Sahajiyas, the real beneficiaries of that Western Upa Sampradaya. Everything is made easy in this third transformation, 
and cheap afterlife guarantees are made easier to qualify for as well. It's ye old society, friendship, and love gambit in but a new guise. This current iteration, iteration is a different mission from the one that Prabhupada brought to the West, but that's long gone. It's gone. It's gone. Ego-based love bombing in the current thing now amounts to nothing more than an attempt to, track, to attract the mass rather than the class. Never for a moment underestimate the power of their particular brand of love bombing, as it is very effective. Now that love bombing certainly doesn't attract the intellectual and logical class of man or woman, but so-called ISKCON doesn't want them. They eventually become troublemakers. They spot discrepancies, contradictions, deviations, and deceptions. They spot them so obviously early on because they're not stricken with a poor fund of knowledge when they approach the cult. And that's not what it wants anywhere near its orbit. In a sense, you can say that so-called ISKCON asks the hedonistic Vikarmis to trade their current affiliations for a new one, which fulfills the same needs but in a rather different way. Love bombing is essential to pulling this off. Compromise with Western society is just as essential. And that's why the ISKCON brand is nothing more than a new Western variety of the semblance of religion coated with an Eastern veneer, a veneer which is getting thinner and thinner by the year. If you think that so-called ISKCON is a representative of Gaudiya Vaishnavism and connected to that line of disciplic succession, guess again! Opulent deity worship alone establishes no such thing, and perhaps you should have known this before even approaching the cult. If you didn't know it then, and you're watching this video, you should know it now. So-called ISKCON is based upon the legitimacy of the Mother Church, which of course is its governing body. However, the disciplic succession in Vaishnavism in any authorized Sampradaya is carried on by its self-realized representatives. If there are none, it is in grave danger of ceasing to exist. A legitimate Vaishnav society is never carried on by some kind of commission, as such a thing never has the right to determine via institutional pre-approval who can and cannot initiate new disciples with the Bhukti Lata Bij. When the history of Prabhupada's branch of the Sampradaya is written decades from now, the GBC will not only have no position whatsoever in that disciplic succession, it will be condemned for interfering with its success if it turns out that it did succeed, which is certainly not a given at this time. Each and every male initiated regular guru of Srila Prabhupada, those accepted by him during his physical manifestation between the years 1966 and 1977, has the opportunity and the right to act on that status and then, and only then, receive Prabhupada's order to link disciples to his branch of the Guru Parampara. This is each of their spiritual birthrights. So-called ISKCON in its branding occludes this fact. ISKCON branding is integral to its strategy, which entails disguising the fact that it has been an up a since March 1978. It also covertly brands itself as an adapted form of New Age West, when that is thought to fulfill its objectives. Ever heard of Krishna West? Throughout all of this, the vitiating governing body decides who is and who is not guru. In and of itself, that is bogus. 
even if the cult had otherwise been bona fide, which is certainly far, far from the case. It is incumbent upon you to see it for what it is and be able to transcend all of its masks. So-called ISKCON is a society of the cheaters and the cheated. If you were cheated by its misleaders, you should have learned your lesson by now. Feel free to bid them farewell, knowing that you are leaving a society of mere starfishes in the vast sea of Maya, the sea of heartbreak. You have a genuine spiritual life to live you do not need them at all. If you bought that ticket with your tears, then it's time to stop whining and end that roller coaster ride. Said Ava Samyang.